but uh, yeah, welcome to the second session of our quantum mechanics seminar. So um, this semester we have a new change in the organization crew. So uh, Yaroslav Haslinger was substituted by uh, Peter Gopov. Peter Gopov is an associate professor of in the Department of Numerical Mathematics. So, so you know, together with uh, me, Sharka, and uh, Miroslav Faisal, we will organize a seminar in this semester and further. And today's speaker is uh, Leonard Machin from the University of Münster in Germany. Uh, Leonard got his master degree last year from the University of Münster under the guidance of, of uh, Manuel Friedrich, our frequent visitor here in Prague. And uh, today he will tell us about uh, the progress of his PhD thesis, and this is on this was the compound uh, theories. Okay, so thank you for the kind of introduction. Um, and before I start with the action model, uh, I really want to explain the Kelvin Hook model in one dimension. So we have a spring and the dashboard that is covered in parallel. And now think about some volume that is attached below those two components. And if we start them with an initial position, such that the spring is a little bit stretched, uh, stretch, then the spring tries to reach a state of uh, minimal elastic energy, and um, the, the volume is slowly, slowly moved to an equilibrium state. And this process is slowed down because of the, of the damping. And, and now we consider a three-dimensional version. Um, so these are the quasi-static um, momentum equilibrium equations. And um, yeah, so I briefly explain what those components mean. So we start first of all with a reference configuration omega. So think about the material that is uninformed. Um, and now this small w is a mapping that maps each material point of the uninformed uh, yeah, material to the deformed to the deformed material to the yeah, to the point in space. Okay, and then. If we have a solution to this equation, then if we start with an initial position of the, uh, the of the material, so like think about a material that is stretched or bended, then it slowly returns to a um, state of minimal elastic energy. So because we have two stress tensors in this equation, so the first one um, is the elastic stress tensor that depends only on the deformation gradient, and um, uh, we have the viscous stress tensor, which additionally depends on the time derivative. So it depends on the strain rate. Um, okay. And there are many possible examples um, which uh, can be yeah, which can, can be modeled with this model property. So and my favorite example is the spine. So maybe you know about the effect that um, the human is taller in the morning. Um, then in the evening, so only with a difference of small millimeters, but this is because the gravitation acts on the spine vertically during the day. And in the night, the spine can recover, um, and this is a slow process. So this part you can see um, as an example of a viscoelastic material. Um, okay. And um, now we come to the modeling assumption of those stress tensors. We assume that. Um, the, both of the stress tensors can be calculated from a potential um, W or R respectively. So the first main assumption on W is the frame difference principle. So if we change the frame, if we change the perspective on the experiment, um, nothing should, uh, should happen. Um, so th this should not be seen by the elastic energy, so a rotation. And we have a um, growth condition uh, which is often used um, and maybe also physically relevant. So um, we assume quadratic growth. And if we assume that the uh, deformation is relatively small, then it's close to the, uh, the deformation rate is close to the identity, then we uh, shouldn't have some elastic energy. And if we have a huge deformation gradient, then we are far away from the set of rotations, and then uh, the elastic energy should uh, increase. So those are the main assumptions of the elastic energy. There are some more, but these are the most uh, relevant ones. So now I owe you the assumptions of the um, viscous stress tensor. And we assume that R can be calculated from a, a distance D. 
because later um, we will view this equation by means of gradient flow symmetric spaces. Um, and this is done by calculating the, the Hessian of the speed. So we obtain a fourth order tensor, and then we multiply F dot from the right and from the left. So we see that this potential R is quadratic in F dot. So, and as we know that we, so in the equation, you can see that we can calculate the stress tensor by taking the derivative into the second component. So this implies that the viscous stress tensor is linear in F dot, so linear in the strain. But it always depends uh, additionally on this F um, in a nonlinear range. So also here we have a frame indifference principle on, on D. So this is a time analogous version of uh, frame indifference. And the simplest example for this metric um, is this one. So we just take F1 transpose times F1 minus uh, F2 transpose um, times F2. And then we immediately see that this frame indifference principle is satisfied. Um, okay, and this would lead to a potential that is written in the yeah, in the following way. Um, okay, and uh, we also could um, yeah, consider more general metrics if we just um, consider a lower bound um, on the metric. And this would result in a potential that can be bounded from below by a constant timeless expression, uh, what you can see, what you have seen in the example. Okay, so this approach itself um, goes back to a paper by Mirko Orton and Singri, and they also try to derive weak solutions for the equations, but they um, had difficulties in dimension um, if the dimension was greater than two, and they only derived weak solutions in uh, in one dimension. So what we do today is to consider a regularization of the equation. So you can see it now on the slide. So we now assume that the elastic stress um, depends uh, via this um, potential W on the deformation gradient, but now also on the second gradient. And this, um, this uh, differential operator can again be calculated from a potential P. And um, this P satisfies also some growth conditions, like the one. Uh, uh, so we have a polynomial growth uh, with respect to the P power, and P is greater than three. And later you will see why we need P is greater than three. Okay. And um, this is what I wanted to tell you about the, the modeling. And now we, um, so this uh, equation was investigated quite recently. And the first result that I'd like to mention is the one from uh, Manuel and Martin, who are both here uh, today. Um, and the, they derived solutions for these equations for yeah, small strains. Um, and they also used this metric gradient flow approach. But they also linearize these equations to derive a standard model in uh, linear viscoelasticity. Um, but then uh, Thomas Mirka, uh, uh, Alex Mirka, and Thomas Lubicek um, investigate this model also for large frames, and they additionally um, considered the thermodynamic coupling of these equations. And they then covered, yeah, yeah, covered the, the existence for, for large frames. Okay. And then I also would like to mention um, the result from Stefan Krömer and Tom Um uh, They, in their paper, they also considered um, yeah, a constraint um, such that the material can't in interpenetrate itself. So, yeah. And recently in this year, um, Rufat, uh, Manuel, and Martin uh, again analyzed the model by uh, Minka and Rubicek. Um, yeah, by changing the approximation the procedure, and also uh, they yeah they also linearize the model. Okay. So for the remaining talk, we are interested in a thin viscoelastic virus. So we now assume that the reference configuration is really really thin. So material the material we want to analyze um, is really thin um, and has the form of a cuboid. So we have a fixed length L with H and the height of delta H. And what we want to do in the talk is now uh, to send H to zero. 
This delta H is a parameter that tends to zero much faster than H. Okay. And additionally, um, we have a, um, a parameter uh, before the differential operator, before the regularization. And this is the parameter that vanishes in the limit because we want to have this regularization to be uh, very small. And also for compactness reasons, we assume that the force term on the right only acts in the, in the vertical dimension. Okay. So um, maybe also something about the literature. If you fix now the delta H, so delta H is fixed, and only H tends to zero, you would obtain an object which looks like a plate. And um, this dimension uh, reduction was investigated by uh, Manu and Martin. And um, yeah, they derived the effect common for obvious elastic plates. And this model, um, yeah, this uh, dimension reduction was based on a gamma convergence result by Lisa from 2006. Um, okay, and what we want to do today is to perform the dimension reduction to one dimension to, to one dimension um, by using the gamma convergence result by Freddy Mora and Paroni um, from 2013. But at this point, I also like to stress that there are the the purely elastic uh, the purely elastic uh, case was studied really extensively, and there are many papers. And the first one that um, the sense uh, takes the limit from three dimensions to one dimensions that I'm aware of is the one from Moore and Miller from 2003, which would result in uh, these equations. But there's also an evolutionary uh, result with inertia, but without viscosity. So then we have an um, acceleration term in, in the equations. Okay. Um, so with this, I come to the outline of the talk and to some questions. The questions that arise now is uh, uh, what are the effective one-dimensional equations and what are the limiting variables? Um, yeah, because so far we only have one uh, variable w and the question is now, so this w depends on all three coordinates. So we want to identify effective limiting variables. We want to know if there exist solutions to the limiting problem. And we are interested in the relation of both of these problems. Okay. And um, yeah, first I'd like to talk briefly about the static problem, so about the gamma convergence result, um, which only comes to the elastic case. Then I will uh, give a brief introduction of the gradient flows. In this context, I also talk about stability, which will be relevant um, for the limiting passage. Um, and then finally, I formulate the one dimensional problem and uh, pass to the limit. Okay, so we start with the, um, the static problem. So the basic idea is to study um, this function. So we have the scaling parameter of sine h um, and the uh, yeah, the elastic energy, and we want to study this function by means of gamma convergence. And um, usually, what we first prove is a compactness result. So, if we have the bound energy of this uh, uh, this quantity, can we pass to a subsequent step that the deformation variable um, uh, yeah will converge? And therefore, it's convenient to reformulate this problem and to transform the the problem into a fixed domain, because at the moment, the domain depends on H. And for uh, yeah, for the read compactness, we want to uh, yeah, reformulate this problem and rescale it. And uh, this is how we do that. So in the beginning, I introduced this uh, uh, deformation variable W that depends on omega H. So omega H is on the thin domain. And then we introduce Y by rescaling the second and the third coordinate. Um, okay, and then of course, um, yeah, we uh, we need to introduce the scale gradient because we now uh, rescale the energy. Okay, so we will now consider this type of energy. Um, so we know everything's rescaled, um, and now. 
Um, so this model itself was studied um, in this paper by Freddy, Mora, and Paroni, but without boundary conditions and without the um, without the second grade. And um, therefore, I now introduce um, the set of visible deformation. So this will be relevant for the formulation uh, as a gradient flow later. Therefore, I introduce this set. And those um, this set, there are functions contained that are W2P. They have bound energy, and they coincide with the identity at the boundary um, of the of the beam. Okay. And then we derive compactness in terms of the scale displacements. Um, okay, so we just measure um, the deviation from the identity into um, yeah, the i-th directions for i equal to one, two, and three. And then, um, yeah, as we assume that we have a, a bounded elastic energy, it's easy to see that the deformation gradient converges to the identity. And therefore, it's uh, reasonable to scale uh, these displacements. So, um, the scaling in the denominator is the natural scaling that arises when you study uh, the scale uh, displacements. And then um, you can show by geometric rigidity that these uh, variables to h converge weakly in h1 um, yeah, to, to a function that has a structure. Um, such that those sides only depend on x1, so only on, depend on this one-dimensional limiting object. Um, and we have some affine uh, perturbations in the first variable. And um, yeah, we denote this topology by sigma will be relevant later. Okay, so as we want to prove the gamma convergence result, we now um, yeah, show you um, what the topology is. And to now we want to set the limiting function. And therefore, we introduce quadratic forms. So uh, we take the Hessian of W at the identity and multiply F on the left and right to obtain the quadratic form. So um, this is a linearized, uh, yeah, it is tested the tensor of this CW. CW is maybe uh, you're familiar, familiar with it. And um, for the gamma convergence result, we also need to define reduced quadratic forms. So we minimize over some entries that arise in the quadratic forms, and then we obtain again the quadratic form. Then the limiting functional can be um, represented like this. So we only have dependence on uh, the length of the uh, of the beam, so of the one-dimensional object. This is uh, seen in the intervals, and and, um, yeah, we have three terms. In the first uh, integral, we have only dependence of the first derivative. And in the second um, uh, integral, we have also a dependence on the second derivative of this side. Uh, don't care about this uh, function theta. This also arises from the compactness, but for simplicity, we don't talk about this uh, today. Um, okay, and then you can show that uh, phi h converges um, to phi zero in the sense of gamma convergence. And this is now also true uh, with boundary conditions and also with the second order perturbation. Okay, so this was now the, the static problem. So we have now identified the limiting problem in elasticity. And now we want to formulate the three dimensional um, uh, equations of nonlinear risk elasticity. As a gradient flow in the metric space. And therefore, I really start from scratches and um, introduce the basic setting. <clears throat> so, the abstract setting can be written in the following way. We start with uh, an arbitrary Hilbert space, H. Um, we assume that phi is Fauché differentiable, and we consider this gradient flow problem. Then, so maybe to have a picture in mind, what does happen if um, the Hilbert space is just the uh, RD. Um, so then you can think so the solution uh, has then the following property. So those solutions are somewhat illustrated in the scores. If we start with the initial position um, of a ball, and this uh, this is the graph of phi, 
then the ball always follows the path in which the uh, the graph decreases fastest. So always takes the direction into the uh, into the minus gradient and uh, to the negative gradient. And um, okay, this is a picture you could have should have in mind, or that I have in mind. But what we want to do now is to generalize this equation um, to matrix spaces. And the problem that arises here is that if you take the time derivative of u in a metric space, um, it's difficult to generalize it because in a metric space, you don't have linear structure anymore. And um, yeah, therefore, it's not clear how to do it. And the approach now is to um, find an equivalent formulation of the gradient flow problem in a different space. And with this formulation, it will be possible to generalize um, the gradient flow setting. And this is done by this following uh, characterization. So again, we start with the Hilbert space H, a differentiable functional, and a sufficiently smooth um, uh, function U. Then we have the following equivalence. So U is the solution to the gradient flow if and uh, only if uh, G U T is equal to zero for every T. And G U T is now defined um, uh, by, by those four terms. We have an energy evaluated um, of the perfect time T plus this, um, this time derivative term uh, plus this, um, yeah, the, the slope term and we subtract the energy of the initial data. And to show um, the equivalence, this is really easy in the Hilbert space. Once we start with the solution of the gradient flow, we just square it. Then if we take a binomial expansion, we end up with the right side. And then if we integrate it, we exactly um, end up with GUT equals to zero. Moreover, the, the other direction is also similar. Um, you can show that we also have this balance um, if we replace zero with S, and then if we divide this balance by S minus T and send S to T, we will end up with the right hand side of this equivalence, and then we just can go back and obtain the solution. Okay. And um, to summarize, or maybe what we know use now is if we start with the Hilbert space H and the Frechet differential functional and the smooth function which satisfies this balance, then we know that U is also a solution of the um, gradient flow equation. And now we have an advantage. We, as you remember, we want to generalize this to metric spaces. And now we only take the, uh, the modulus of the time derivative and the modulus of the, um, of the slope. Therefore, we will define those quantities now. So we replace exactly those quantities that are now hybridized in red. So now we start with a complete metric space. Um, so with metric D, um, we have a function that uh, lives on the space S. And we say that the curve uh, U is a curve of maximum slope if this energy identity is satisfied. So this is also known as uh, the Georgian method. Uh, and yeah, if you want to read something about this, I really recommend the book by Ambrose um, Gidi and Savare. Um, yeah, they really uh, investigated the, uh, the gradient flow in the metric space. And it's really good. Okay, now I owe you the definitions. So now um, we get rid of the, so first it was necessary to use the linear structure of the Hilbert space. Now we just take the metric in the enumerator uh, to define the metric derivative. And similar for the local slope, um, we divide uh, now by the, the metric. So these are the natural uh, generalizations of those quantities. Okay. Um, now we are in the position to formulate a three dimensional problem um, in yeah, a square between both in a metric space. We recall now um, what we have defined in the uh, elastic problem. So we start with uh, deformations with bound of energy, and we have dirichlet boundary conditions on the sides of the plate. And we recall that this exactly was our elastic energy. So the only part that is missing now 
is um, yeah the metric. What's the metric uh, to define it as a metric gradient flow? Yeah, and the rescale metric is introduced by this function um, by the scaling parameter, and we take the integral of this function d that I presented in the beginning of the, of the model. Um, yeah. Okay. So those are the three quantities that we need to define. And now the idea is to prove that there exist solutions um, yeah, to the generalized gradient flow. So we want to show that there exists now a curve of maximum slope. And this is the first result that I want to present. So this is what uh, Manuel and I have proven. Um, if we start with an initial datum, then for small h, there exists a curve of maximum slope. So a curve that satisfies this, this balance. And additionally, y h is a weak solution uh, to these equations. Okay, but here I want to stress that, of course, the, the pure existence of uh, weak solutions was investigated before. Um, yeah, and this was the first result for uh, very large strains. Um, so this covered everything was uh, taken by me from the root. The novelty of this uh, result is now that we also have this certain energy balance in terms of gradient flows in the metric specs. Okay. Mm, okay. Uh, on this slide, I want to explain you why we need the second gradient, why we need uh, the regularization. Um, because how do you tackle this problem? Usually you do it um, by a time speed of, uh, approximation. So we start with our emission datum, uh, we fix the time step tau, and then we solve this problem uh, for every n. So elastic energy and dissipation distance are competing somehow. Um, and then once we define interpolations, we want to pass tau to the, to the limit. Uh, tau to zero, send tau to zero. Um, okay, and maybe this is not clear why this is the right um, or the right choice to derive solutions. But if you calculate the Euler Lagrange equations and sum it up and then pass to the limit at least formally, you see that we end up with uh, the, yeah, the right equations. Okay, so formally you, you get the right equations. But to do, to do it rigorously, um, it's not possible to pass to the limit. Because in the beginning, I've told you that we assume a frame indifference principle. Um, okay, and this frame indifference implies that we only get uh, a L2 control on this quantity. So we always have this nonlinear dependence on this gradient of, of y. Um, Okay, and to pass to the limit, we really need that we have an L2 bound on the strain rate. Um, and this is an inequality that is only true when the gradient of Yn is a continuous function with control determinant from below. And this is known as a generalized quantum inequality. Um, and this, yeah, this means the continuity and the values from the below. And this was also observed by uh, Milka and Lubitschek. So, yeah, they used this inequality. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, now we come back to the, um, uh, the metric gradient flow structure. So, we want to know now if we have a solution of the gradient flow, can we expect that uh, solutions of the gradient flow converge to a curve? Uh, that um, that is the gradient flow with respect to the limiting energy. So we start with the gamma convergence result. This is what we have, and the question is now: Can we expect that the gradient flows also converge if we only have a gamma convergence result? And this is not true, and this is seen by the following example. Um, we just take as uh, as limit. We just take um, uh, uh, x squared. And we approximate this functions by uh, having a small local minimum at the point uh, one plus uh, one divided by n. Um, okay, and those functions now converge to phi. So in the end, in the limit, we don't have the local minimum. Um, yeah, but uh, all of those functions have a local minimum at this point. 
Okay, and then if we have a solution to the to the gradient flow with respect to phi n, um, the solution would stop in the slope minimum. So this is what I want to explain in the beginning uh, with this picture. And plus, of course, these uh, solutions will converge to a function that do not satisfy the gradient flow equations in the limit because the limiting flow uh, would end up in this uh, local minimum at zero. So this is a simple example that we need more than gamma convergence to, pass to the limit in the evolutionary setting. Okay. And um, so this was just the idea that we need more. This was further um, investigated by Sanye and Sefati. Um, yeah, in the paper by, from 2004. So the idea is now that we have solutions to the um, uh, to the equations in nonlinear viscoelasticity in three dimensions. We have this energy balance, and now we want to pass to the limit. So we only have gamma convergence, which is clearly not enough. And the question is, what else do we need? So we have, a, as we have a gamma convergence result, and the energies appear in one of the summons, this suggests to have a limit inequality of every sum. Because if we prove this, then we then at least we would have a um, inequality in the limit. So in the end, this only implies this inequality. Okay, but also if we if the limiting problem satisfy uh, satisfies the chain rule. Then we would get the reverse of the inequality by um, yeah by employing Young's inequality. Okay, um, of course we need to define the limiting metric first, and we will do this in a second. But to conclude, what we want to show today now is we need to show that there exists a limiting curve, um, with, which converges uh, with respect to the topology that we defined in elasticity. Uh, we need to show uh, lower semi-continuity of the metric derivatives and the slopes. And we need to show that the limiting functional is a strong upper gradient with respect to the supermetric D0. So, so this is a chain rule condition. And in the last term, in the last term, there also appeared the, the initial datum, and we have to endure that the initial dating convergence. And this exactly corresponds to the recovery sequence. Maybe we briefly go back. If we um, want to have a limit inequality of minus the energy, um, yeah, we get a loop soup. Uh, yeah, we need the loop soup inequality. And as soon as we have a loop soup inequality uh, from the gamma convergence result, we get this for the minus sign, we have a loop soup. Okay. Okay, now um, I'm ready uh, to pass to the limit. So, as I mentioned before, to formulate the metric gradient flow, um, we need to define three main components. Uh, the first one is a set of admissible deformation. So, just a set. We have to assign a suitable metric and we have to define the energy. Um, the energy results from the gamma convergence result. And as I've told you before, the metric has a really similar structure to the elastic energy, and therefore also um, the metric in the limit has a similar structure to the one-dimensional energy. So this is somehow the natural end limit. Um, yeah. And then what you then can show is um, the following. So this is the main design that I want to present today. If we start with an initial data on Y0, that depends on H. Um, and the initial datum, so the energies of the initial datum converge. Um, and if we start with curves of maximum slope, so in particular those satisfy this energy balance, um, which exists by the previous theory, then we also can define the limiting curve of maximum slope that satisfy this uh, energy balance. Um, yeah, and we have convergence in the sense of the topology that we defined. Um, when we say that the elastic gamma converges to that. Okay, so this is the main theorem. And um, yeah, I briefly recalled what we need to show. First of all, we need to show that there exists a limiting curve. 
we need to show a low asymmetric continuity of the metric derivatives and slopes, and we need to show a sort of chain rule. And we will focus on the remaining talk on the first uh, two parts. We want to show that there exists a limiting curve, and we want to show that uh, yeah, the, the part two. Okay, to show the existence of a limiting curve, um, one first needs to endure um, that the distances are lower semi-continuous. And I can tell you this is um, really similar to the gamma convergence result because of our structure of D. Mm -hmm. So this is easy to prove. Um, and then if we start with, uh, with functions with uniform bound energy, um, we can use the compactness result for each equation in a rational point. And if we have this equicontinuity condition, we can extend um, yeah, the convergence for, for each T on the real line. So because if we combine the inequality above with the inequality that we have here, then it's easily seen if we send S to T that we can extend it. Okay. Um, this A, this will be relevant on the next side, uh, which we can construct. Um, so this can be constructed as the weak limit of the metric derivatives. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've shown that there exists a limiting curve, and now the question is if the metric derivatives are lower uh, semi-continuous. And uh, to this end, we use a property. Um, which is satisfied by the metric derivative. So the metric derivative is always the smallest functions among all m's that satisfy this inequality. Okay, and then we immediately obtain the the result because we have shown that uh, the weak limit of the metric derivatives is such a function. So um, this we saw this on the previous slide. And then we just can compute. So we know that the metric derivative in the one dimensional case is smaller than this a squared. And as the metric derivatives converge with t to a, we use convexity and obtain the limit. Okay. So, but this, uh, this theory does not, I mean, uh, this is uh, rather the standard abstract uh, result that we applied. So, this is not new. What um, actually new is, is the lower semi-continuity of the slopes. Um, so the question is now, once we have um, yeah, a sequence that converges to U, um, do we have this lower semi-continuity um, inequality? Do we have this lower semi-continuity condition? Okay, and this is done. So this was, yeah, uh, really yeah, difficult somehow um, because this slope has a really local complicated or local structure. And what we do for at first is to determine um, the slope in the one dimensional setting. And what you observe that this, uh, this limiting function is um, somehow almost convex up to lower order terms. And then you can um, uh, observe that you can characterize the slope by variations of this form. So it's sufficient to take convex combinations. And then you end up with a, uh, with a structure, with a representation of the slope that can be re rewritten like this. So we have this um, lower order terms. Um, yeah. Okay, so it looks similar to the local slope, but we take a global condition. And then we construct mutual recurrence sequences. This, we will do this soon because, um, so if we look at the structure of the local slope in the three dimensional context, we have a, a, we subtract energies in the enumerator and we divide by the metric in the denominator. So, and we just want to show lower semi continuity. So, we need to show the limit inequality for the whole enumerator. And you only obtain uh, from the gamma convergence result uh, the mean inequality for the first part. Here we subtract the elastic energy. And similarly, we only have um, lower semi continuity for the matrix. Uh, and therefore, 
solved. Again, here we have the wrong direction, the inequality. And this is solved by um, constructing this mutual recovery sequences, which satisfy this inequality up to lower order terms. Okay. And then, um, so, okay, maybe for, 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 forget about this one's written here. The important part now is that if we start with the uh, slope in three dimensions and we take uh, the new soup now of this specific mutual recovery sequence, this is of, is of course greater because the local slope is defined by taking any sequence. And then if we substitute this property, we end up with the structure, uh, the representation of the one dimensional slope. So this is a basic uh, proof idea of the lower semi Um Okay. Um, one crucial assumption in the dimension reduction is then is that we can split up the quadratic forms in a suitable way. So we assume that we, um, yeah, that we have um, a part of the quadratic form that only depends on the first entry, on the second entry, and the quadratic form that depends on the uh, remaining entries. And this corresponds to models with zero Poisson ratio. So if we stretch the material in one direction, um, the material remains undeformed uh, in yeah, other directions. So it covers a, a little bit more general class, but uh, yeah, not that many materials. Okay, and one last thing about um, um, the difficulty and the proof of the local slopes. Um, we want to show convergence of the difference of those energies. And what we then do is to use this expansion, so a binomial expansion. And um, this quantity here on the right has a similar structure to the recovery sequence of the gamma convergence we have. And we know that this sequence converges weakly. And therefore, as we have, as we have an integral, we need to ensure that the recovery sequence converges strongly. Otherwise, we don't have convergence uh, of this term. Um, and therefore, the last observation is that we really need strong convergence of the recovery sequence um, yeah, um, in the limiting passage. OK. Then we obtain a balance in the limit. And uh, I do not want to talk about the equations. I really only want to um, give you a taste how to derive those equations. So what we then do is to find suitable bounds in the uh, or characterization of the slopes and method derivatives, and then you uh, yeah you use this balance somehow and you derive those four equations. Um, and lastly, I want to tell you. Um, so in the beginning, uh, the title of the talk was um, one dimensional viscoelastic concomitant theories. So now I want to tell you in which sense this is a concomitant theory. And the reason, main reason uh, we call it concomitant theory is because you can also derive this model um, by sending, by performing a dimension reduction from two dimensions to one dimension. So as I told you, uh, Manuel and Martin derived the concomitant model for plates. And if you start by, from this model, you'll, you'll end up with the same model. So, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, also what Manuel and I have shown. Okay, so I think I'm now on the last slide. So maybe, uh, yeah, what we can do uh, in the future is to also consider the thermodynamic coupling, um, like this was done by uh, Mirka and Rubicek, and perform the dimension reduction um, uh, yeah, together. Um, like it was done for the linearization in the paper by um, Manuel Rufat and Martin. Um, but there we have to proceed um, differently because we don't have the metric gradient construct anymore. And the other thing I'm also interested in is um, to the speed of convergence of this time discrete approximations. Uh, but this is really also difficult because the problem is non convex. But yeah, in the limits, we have a, maybe there's something what can be done. 
Okay, so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.